Father, as we open your word, once again, we pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray, dear Lord, that your word would not only be clear, but the Holy Spirit would impress us to holiness and faithfulness in that which we learn. Bless us and keep us and guide us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been uh, going over, uh, you can call it a series, where we're titling, entitled, we're entitling it uh, The House That Wisdom Built. And in reality, what I'm simply doing is going over some of the basics of Bible doctrine. Uh, every few years or so, I'll do uh, maybe a, a series or whatever that touches on the basics of Bible doctrine. And since uh, for the longest time uh, at our church, we've been going over the series on the Christ, uh, Christ's object lessons, some Bible doctrinal points uh, might be missed out of those. And so therefore, I want to take time now that we're utilizing Zoom and we have moved the study of Christ's object lessons to the afternoon. Um, we're going to go over Bible doctrine. I think it's very important to remind us, to keep us fresh, and to uh, furnish, us, furnish us with the necessary information uh, to be able to share that which we uh, believe. So we have been uh, covering the different aspects of wisdom's uh, house or the pillars that hold up wisdom's house, and we're breaking this up into seven different parts or seven different points. And the first point was the Bible itself, what the Bible says about the scriptures, the scriptures itself. And we've covered that. Now we've moved into the law. And so we are talking about the law and the different aspects of the law. And we covered the origin and character of God's law. We uh, went over or went through the eternity of God's law. Uh, we've covered the relation of God's law to the ceremonial laws, of course, that were uh, done away with. We talked briefly about Christ and the law and the apostles and the law. Uh, we're talking now about the law as a whole, not specific uh, points of the law, but the law as a whole. We talked about obedience to the law and the blessings that come through obedience. And then we transitioned. After that, we, we got into the Sabbath, something specific about the law. And we're not going to cover each and every uh, Ten Commandments uh, in its own uh, you know, uh, study. Maybe we can do that in the future. But as far as the Sabbath is concerned, the fourth commandment, it is the commandment that is most, most contested when it comes to Christianity. And so we were, uh, we we're taking the time to go through the Sabbath specifically. And so we talked about the origin of the Sabbath, reasons for the Sabbath, why God would even give the Sabbath to his people. We went through history and we saw the patriarchs kept the Sabbath. We saw how Israel uh, kept the Sabbath. We got into how Jesus was a Sabbath keeper and taught sabbath keeping how his apostles were sabbath keepers and how they taught sabbath keeping and how the early church kept the sabbath through its history uh as found in the bible and we we even went through some specifics on you know the different number of meetings that they held on the sabbath as recorded by luke in the book of acts and we did that because there is a particular uh text in Luke, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 20, that people like to uh, go to to say that, well, they transitioned from Sabbath worship to first day worship, uh, but we showed that that was not the case. Um, if we went by just simply the number of times that the Bible mentions <clears throat> that they were keeping the Sabbath or worshiping on the Sabbath or meeting on the Sabbath versus the time the Bible mentions that they met on the first day of the week, uh, we had um, well over 80, I think it was like 84 or 85 times the Bible mentions Sabbath meetings by the early church, and only one time that the Bible mentioned a first day meeting. And even then, it was very clear that that wasn't a time that they kept holy. All right, so now we want to transition into a different portion of the history of Sabbath keeping and how the church in the last days will be keeping the Sabbath. <coughs> so, we want to go to Revelation chapter 12. So let's turn there to Revelation, the 12th chapter. And again, this is not by way of a sermon. This is more of a Bible study. So in Revelation, the 12th chapter, we're going to pick up in the 17th verse, the last verse of the chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And in here, we're going to begin to see that the people of God in the end of time, in the last days, are going to be keeping the commandments, including the fourth commandment. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, 
The Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So notice the remnant of the woman, the woman being the symbol of the church in Revelation chapter 12, uh, the woman, her, her seed, her offspring, the remnant of her seed, the final church, the final portions of the true church will be keeping the commandments of God. Uh, with that, just turn over uh, two chapters to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, we have a description of the uh, coming of the Lord, as well as the messages that are going to go forth to usher in the coming of God and the people who will be giving those messages. And one of the messages known as the third angel connects with it these words. And so in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. And notice the Bible is describing who the saints are, who the saints will be. And here are the descriptive, descriptive terms of who the saints are in Revelation 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. <clears throat> here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So again, the Bible identifies that the saints or the remnant in the last days and the end of time will keep the commandments of God. Now, the reason why the church would do so, uh, one of the reasons the church would do so is found in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. So before God closes his canon, before he closes the book, before the Bible ends, he encourages us with these words in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Now, I find it interesting that before the Lord closed the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, he encouraged us to remember the commandments of God. And then before he closes the New Testament in the book of Revelation, he encourages us to keep and remember the commandments. The Bible says in Revelation 22 verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So in Revelation 22, verse 14, one of the reasons the remnant or the saints at the end of time will be keeping the commandments of God is so that we might have the right to eat from the tree of life and be able to enter in through the gates of the city, the commandments of God themselves, therefore becoming the uh, uh, ticket, if you will, or the passport into the city of God. And then finally, uh, go to Isaiah 56, Isaiah chapter 56, we're going to look together in verse 1 and verse 2, Isaiah 56, verse 1 and 2, <clears throat> dealing with this principle, how the Sabbath of God's people in the last days will be the seventh day, not the first day. The Bible says in Isaiah 56, verse 1, and verse two, notice what it says here. And we're gonna connect this with a New Testament verse to kind of bring, to kind of flesh it out a little bit. But notice Isaiah 56, verse one and two, it says, thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice. Now notice this, for my salvation is near to come. We're gonna find out what is being spoken of there. But he says, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. So the Bible shows that when God's salvation is near to come, there is a blessing upon those who keep the Sabbath from polluting the Sabbath. And we'll talk about what it means to pollute the Sabbath in some upcoming portions of today's study. But when is God's salvation near to come? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. So we're going to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And in this particular verse, it's identifying when the salvation of God is near to come, when God is going to bless those who keep the Sabbath. So notice 1 Peter chapter 1. We're looking together in verse 5. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time or the last days. So the salvation of God that is near to come 
is the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last days. And so we're talking about the coming of the Lord. So the church at the end of time, before God comes, before Christ comes the second time, they are going to be blessed because they keep the Sabbath and they do not pollute the Sabbath. So we want to find out what it means to pollute the Sabbath or how not to pollute the Sabbath so that we can be those who will be blessed. Um, let's turn now to Isaiah 66. Go back there to Isaiah chapter 66. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 66. So we looked at the Sabbath in the beginning with the patriarchs, uh, beginning with Adam and his family, going through uh, Abraham and their family or his family. Uh, then we got into Moses, finally, <coughs> finally transitioned to the children of Israel. From the children of Israel, we went into Jesus and his disciples. From Jesus and his disciples, we looked at the early church and how all through the ages of God's people, the true worshipers of God have kept the Sabbath. And then we find that the Sabbath will also be kept in the last days by the last or final true church. Now, what about when Christ comes and all things are made new? Does this mean that there is no longer going to be Sabbath keeping? Well, we're going to see that there's even going to be Sabbath keeping in the new earth. So in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah chapter 66, we're looking in verses uh, 22. <coughs> and 23. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. <laughs> Notice what the Bible says. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make. So notice this, of course, is still yet future. <clears throat> the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And then finally, verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So notice that even in the earth made new, even when all sin is destroyed and God has made all things new, the Bible shows that we will still be keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath, of course, if we remember, is one, one of the purposes of the Sabbath is to remember God's creative works. It is a memorial of creation. And since he's going to make all things new, he's going to memorialize that creative work or those creative works in the Sabbath. And so when you study the new earth, you'll see that there's still going to be seasons and there's going to be planting and things of that nature that will do on the new earth. So therefore, there are still weeks and there are still months and there will still be years, although we're not going to necessarily uh, have to count time per se, uh, although we will know there will be a weekly cycle because of the Sabbath and a monthly cycle because of the new moon. Uh, God will keep these things in place. And so therefore, we'll be able to commemorate his creative works by keeping the Sabbath. Another aspect we saw that it was the reason for Sabbath keeping is a memorial of redemption. And one of the things God told the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, when they were re repeating the law, when he was repeating this fourth commandment, at the end, he was very clear, Moses was very clear to say the reason why we keep the Sabbath or we need to remember the Sabbath is because God delivered us from Egyptian bondage. Of course, Egyptian bondage is a symbol of the bondage of sin and how Christ would free us from sin's control. And so the Sabbath is also a memorial of redemption. And of course, we will be uh, remembering God's redemptive works and that which he has done for us for eternity, being the fact that Christ will have those marks in the palms of his hands. We'll be able to remember what he has done to save us from our sins. And so the Sabbath <coughs> will continuously be kept. Now, there's another text I want to go to that doesn't necessarily mark a period of time, but it identifies individuals that would keep the commandments. And if you look at the book of Psalms 103, <coughs> Psalms 103, verse 20, go with me to Psalms 103, and we're looking in verse 20. Psalms 103 and the 20th verse. Notice in Psalms 103, verse 20, the Bible says, bless, bless the Lord, ye his angels. Now we're talking about the angels of God. 
It says, bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. So we know that means that the angels of God are keeping the commandments now. And the angels of God have always kept the commandments, at least the ones that had not fallen and that have not been cast down to this earth with Satan. But if they keep the commandments now, those commandments that are eternal, that will last forever, they will be keeping the commandments even in heaven as well as the earth made new when we're there with them keeping the commandments. And so therefore the Sabbath will be kept by all of God's creatures, all of his creative beings, all of his creative works. Uh, we will be keeping the Sabbath as a memorial of creation as well as redemption. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, keeping the Sabbath holy, all right? Keeping the Sabbath holy. I want you to go with me to Leviticus 23. There might be some who are watching or some who you're studying with or would like to share with or some who will see this later. And you might be new to the Sabbath or to the principles of Sabbath keeping. And so we want to talk about some basics of how to keep the Sabbath holy. And all those the, although these be basic, some of these principles are important reminders for many of us who are Sabbath keepers currently. So in the book of Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, we're going to go to verse 32, Leviticus 23, 32, and this particular verse simply uh, solidifies the principle that God laid down in Genesis chapter 1, which we will cover in just a moment. So in Leviticus 23, we're talking now about uh, how to keep the Sabbath, how to properly keep the Sabbath. Now, in Leviticus 23, verse 32, the Bible says this, it shall be unto you, speaking of the Sabbath, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month, uh, at even, from even to even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Of course, um, there were the ceremonial Sabbaths as well as the weekly Sabbath, but principally speaking, the Sabbaths in general were kept from even to even, or from evening to evening. Remember, a day in Genesis chapter one begins at evening, continues through morning, and when the new evening comes, the new day begins. So one full day was an evening and a morning. And so therefore, when we're keeping the Sabbath, we're keeping it from the evening of the sixth day, which is Friday evening, which begins the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. And we keep that all the way to the evening of the seventh day, which begins the new week or the first day of the week, according to the Bible. So the Sabbath is to be kept, be kept from Friday evening to Saturday evening, all right? It is a full period of the evening and a morning. And the, this is how we are to properly keep the Sabbath as far as when, all right? So when we're keeping the Sabbath is not on a Sunday, it's not on a Wednesday or a Friday. Uh, the Sabbath is to be kept from evening of the sixth day to the evening of the seventh day, all right? Which constitutes a full seventh day. Now, Go to Isaiah 56 again. This is a text we've already read, but I want to go back to it to highlight something uh, there. So we're going to Isaiah 56 and we're looking together in verse two. So we're looking at Isaiah 56. <coughs> Forgive me. Isaiah 56, verse two. In Isaiah 56, verse two, the Bible said, and we've read this already, it says, blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. So how is it possible to pollute the Sabbath? What are ways in which the Sabbath can be polluted? And of course, we're not going to have a whole list of you know, the ways we can pollute the Sabbath. We can spend all day just talking about ways to pollute the Sabbath. But let's deal with some highlight points that would be the broad spectrum and would cover all of the things that we can put there. So in order to do so, let's flip over two chapters to Isaiah 58 and let's see what the Bible has to say. So in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah chapter 58, we're gonna look in verse 13. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 13, Isaiah 58 and verse 13. I'll give you time to uh, turn there. Isaiah 58 
13. All right. So the Bible says, if thou turn away thy foot, now notice the language here, if, I, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. And so when the Bible in the book of Isaiah is talking about polluting the Sabbath, one way that the Sabbath can be polluted is by us doing our own ways, by us finding our own pleasures, and by us speaking our own words. And so the Bible encourages us uh, to holiness, saying, turn our foot away from the Sabbath. Now, when we look at that, we can go, we can take it a little bit deeper. What does it mean to take thy foot away from the Sabbath? The foot in the Bible uh, is uh, connected with, with, with travel, for an example. Uh, if, you, if you flip over with me to the book of Proverbs chapter four, if you look at Proverbs chapter four, um, look at verse uh, 26 and 27. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 4, 26 and 27. We'll see the foot is basically spoken of as an instrument of motion and travel. Uh, the foot is also, uh, you know, an indication of what we do. All right. So notice what it says in the book of Proverbs chapter 4. We're looking at verse 26 and 27. The Bible says this, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left, remove thy foot from evil. So notice in verse 26, it tells us to ponder the path of our feet. In verse 27, it tells us to remove our foot from evil. So by pondering the path of our feet, we're observing attentively our goings or what we're doing. All right, where we're going. Um, and then in Proverbs 27, where it says, remove thy foot from evil, we're abstaining from evil. We're not going anywhere to execute evil, to do evil. We're, we're careful with our actions. So one of the ways we can desecrate the Sabbath, pollute the Sabbath, is by traveling too much. What, is, what, what would that mean? Well, you know, uh, I'm not getting into, you know, uh, Judaism or Phariseeism, uh, that, you know, had all these laws as far as uh, traveling on the Sabbath and what we're supposed to do. But we do have very clear counsel that too much travel, travel can desecrate the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, um, it would be important for us if we had far to go on the Sabbath. For an example, uh, there would be many times that <coughs> I would be invited to speak at different churches. And uh, some of these churches could be hours away, um, could be, you know, even you know, states away or, or whatever. And so <clears throat> what we would want to do is prepare for that. So it would be best, it would be best practice to prepare in advance for that type of travel. How would that look? Well, if I had to travel, say, four hours to preach at a church on Sabbath morning, it would be best to travel there Friday, find a place to stay and uh, keep the Sabbath do you know do your work do the ministry that the lord had called you to do and then travel back home when sabbath is over that would be the best practice um of course anything further away from that you would of course probably prepare for that anyhow so it's best to take that type of um it's best to make that those type of preparations um if we had to go somewhere that would require a plane ticket or or a bus ticket or you know a train ticket or a boat ticket or something of that nature, we would want to make sure that we would travel in advance of the Sabbath. And uh, if for whatever reason, there's counsel on this, if for whatever reason that could not be done, we would want to make sure that our ticket is purchased prior to the Sabbath. Uh, and so that we don't have any business transactions taking place on the Sabbath. So, you know, ponder the paths of your feet you know, uh, remove your feet from evil, the Bible says. Take your foot from the Sabbath. Be careful where you go. Don't travel too much. You know, one of the things um, that the Sabbath is a memorial of, memorial of is God's creative works. I want to remind you of a text, for an example, in the book of, um, uh, go to Psalms 111. 
Let's go there. Go to Psalms 111. So 111. Psalms 111. <coughs> Psalms 111. And as you're turning there, you know, of course, travel now is a little bit easier than travel was back in Bible days or even in uh, the days of our uh, Advent pioneers. However, we still want to take these principles to heart and make sure that by needless travel, we are not desecrating the Sabbath. But um, when it comes to God's creative works, um, I want you to look at Psalms 111. And the reason why I'm talking about God's creative works is, be, is, is a principle that you see here in Isaiah 58 that sometimes is misunderstood. So look at Isaiah 50, uh, excuse me, Psalms 111. <clears throat> and let's look at verses two through four. All right, Psalms 111, verse two through four. The Bible says, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. All right, so keep that in mind. So the works of the Lord are great. They're sought out uh, of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious. His righteousness endureth forever. He made his, work, his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. <clears throat> when we talked about uh, reasons for Sabbath keeping, we talked about memorializing creation. And here in Psalms 111, God made his wonderful works to be remembered. And what better day uh, of the week to remember God's creative works than to take pleasure in going into nature on Sabbath, right? That's a wonderful way to keep the Sabbath, going out into nature and, and to enjoy and take in the scenes of nature. And sometimes <clears throat> we might live in a location where, you know, there's not too much nature, you know, um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, I know people who, uh, you know, were raised in an environment where, you know, it was very rare that they would see patches of grass. Um, everything was concrete around them. And so it was, it was almost out of sorts that they would be where grass and trees and things of that nature would be. Um, if you're in an environment like that, try to find a place where there is is nature of some sort, even if it's just something simple as a park, if that's all you can do, um, go out there, look at the grass and the trees and the flowers and the things of that nature uh, and ponder God's wonderful works. But I want to bring up a point here. In Psalms 111 verse 2, <clears throat> the Bible says the works of the Lord are great and they're sought out by all them that have pleasure therein. Um, and so let's kind of connect this with the principle of turning our foot away from the Sabbath and not doing necessary, unnecessary travel and uh, being careful of the things that we do and where we go. Um, from me, it might take about four hours or so or four hours plus to go to Yosemite. You know, it's a place that I, I, I enjoy. It's a wonderful, beautiful place. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily plan on going to Yosemite on Sabbath from my home. In other words, it's not like I'm going to, you know, finish the sermon today and we're going to pack up the car and go to Yosemite and just take in the sights. Even if we have a seasonal pass and don't have to pay for it on the Sabbath, um, that would just be unnecessary travel. I would, however, go and stay at a friend's house that lives closer there by and maybe is within an hour's drive uh, to Yosemite or something. I remember when we used to stay a little bit further north uh, in Delano. I remember we would take Sabbath afternoons after church. Sometimes we would go up to Three Rivers or places like that, just beautiful uh, just uh, areas and just enjoy nature because it was closer. But um, there's places around here where I live now. It's more desert, of course, but there's wonderful places. Friends of ours told us that there is a, a waterfall. I had no idea there was a waterfall nearby <clears throat> here in Lancaster. Those are places I have never gone, never seen. Uh, but those are the kind of things we can do, but we don't want to travel too far to enjoy them. And so if we are going to go to a place where we would have to travel <coughs> to get there, an unneeded travel to get there, let's, let's plan for those things, maybe get closer there on Friday so that we can enjoy it on the Sabbath and not needlessly travel. So that's one of the principles that you can bring out in turning our foot away from the Sabbath. <coughs> But the Bible also says in Isaiah 50, uh, 58, verse 13, um, if you're, you've probably turned from there, I had you turn to Psalms, but go back to Isaiah 58 and verse 13. <clears throat> We're still talking about Sabbath keeping. In Isaiah 58, 13, if thou turn thy foot away from the, or turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. 
uh, a lot of people uh, sometimes, you know, rest the scriptures when it comes to this particular verse. Uh, a lot of different things uh, can be thought of. People will say, well, I enjoy nature. Um, I take pleasure in nature. So the Bible says not to do my pleasure on God's holy day. So I can't go see nature on the side. But that's, that's not what God is talking about. Um, matter of fact, if you dig deeper into this particular verse, uh, the pleasure that is being talked about here is more so in, in personal vocation and labor. And we're going to see um, how we can tie that in to this particular verse. So if we have pleasure, for an example, in serving souls, that doesn't mean you don't do that on the Sabbath. If we have pleasure in nature, that doesn't mean you don't do that on the Sabbath. You know, if we have pleasure in, in nice food, that doesn't mean you don't eat on the Sabbath. Uh, we just have to be careful not to get into gluttony and feasting. And that is uh, something that is brought out as well in Isaiah 58, 13. So we're not doing our own pleasure on this holy day. We're calling it a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. We're honoring him, not doing our own ways, finding our own pleasure or speaking our own words. And what's very interesting is the very way that many people desecrate the Sabbath, um, Isaiah 58, 13, uh, deals with those points. You know, there are those who will take the day, uh, the Sabbath off. You know, sometimes it's, uh, merely looked at is I don't have to do any vocational work. You know, I don't have to worry about my job. Okay, I get that day off. Well, um, you know, society, for an example, already gives us the weekend, right? And so there's nothing really great and special about taking Sabbath off from laboring at your vocation, laboring at your work, if society already gives you that day. It's much more than that. That's not necessarily what God is speaking of here. Uh, but many of us, we turn that day from a day of labor to a day of gluttony and feasting to a day of rioting and, 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 and frivolities. And we have to be careful that we do not get, engage in those things on the Sabbath day. Uh, we have to make sure that we remember God on the Sabbath. We have to be careful with our words. We have to be careful with our actions. We have to be careful with our thoughts, the things that we're doing. Remember, the Sabbath is a day of worship. It's a God day, not a my day. A lot of the times we look forward to the Sabbath because it's a day to take off. That's not what the Sabbath is about. It's not, it's a blessing for you. Yes, it's a gift for you, but it's so that we can remember God. And we have to remember that. We have to remember those things. Now, in the context of Isaiah chapter 58 and the Sabbath, you know, if you read the context of Isaiah 58, it's pretty interesting that at the end, the Sabbath is mentioned because people have a hard time connecting it with the totality of the chapter. But if you actually re if you actually go back to Isaiah 58, let's start in verse one. It's only 14 verses. I want to read through the chapter and then we'll see the context of what God is speaking about in regards to the Sabbath in Isaiah 58, verse 13. So in Isaiah 58, let's just start in verse one. <clears throat> Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice that they, that they take, excuse me, uh, they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, they say, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Now remember, in the context of Isaiah 58, 13, uh, not doing our own pleasure on the Sabbath, right? Let's start bringing these points together. So what God is speaking of here, here's Israel. And they say, Lord, we're, we love your ordinance. We, we, we love the spiritual things. We're, we're doing spiritual things. We're fasting. We're, we're, we're being spiritual people. But you're not, taking, you're not taking knowledge. You're taking no notice of what we're doing. <clears throat> and God says, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Now, that's a very interesting phrase, exact all your labors. Um, what that actually means is they exploit all their laborers, all right? If you look at that in the original language. So in other words, this particular time of fasting or, or rest and inactivity from uh, uh, physical things and, and they're, they're focusing, maybe, maybe they're at church on that particular time uh, of spiritual fasting and spiritual ordinance, but they have other people working or there's work going on that would benefit them labor. 
or benefit them later. And so God says, listen, on the day of your fast, <coughs> you find pleasure and you exploit your laborers is what it's saying here. In verse four, it says, behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite, <coughs> smite with the fist of wickedness. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day, make your voice to be heard on high. Remember in Isaiah 58, 13, it's talking about not speaking our own words. And if you look in the original language, it's speaking about words of strife. It's speaking about, you know, arguing and things of that nature. This is what Israel was doing. They may have identified the Sabbath. They may have not personally been doing physical labor. They may have been uh, fasting on that day, or they may have been in a synagogue on that day, but they were having others do work for them, or they were, you know, uh, 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 you know, arguing, or maybe be their their tone, their words. Maybe they were talking things that were not spiritual. Uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, finding their own pleasure. In other words, being benefited by their own vocation on that day, their own works. In other words, their foot was desecrating the Sabbath. And God says, "This is this is not what you should do." It says in verse five, and this is the embodiment now. In Isaiah 58, we're about to read, this is the embodiment of true Sabbath keeping. Remember, there's a principle in the book of Matthew chapter 12, where Christ says it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. And so here's the principle now of true Sabbath keeping. Look at verse five. It says, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, it, we're getting into it. Um, uh, the, the, the principle of true Sabbath keeping. It says, is it is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Is it not, is, is not this the fast that I've chosen? Here's the principle, to loose the bands of, wicked, of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light bring forth, break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou turn away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity, if thou turn out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness shall be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually <clears throat> and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. And thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in. And we know verse 12 is specifically dealing with the third angel and those who are going forth to uh, preach the Sabbath and, and, and preach the Sabbath more fully. Well, <clears throat> Isaiah 58 is dealing with the principle of true Sabbath keeping, not that we just relegate our, 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 our labors of love and our benevolent works to the Sabbath. That's not what it's saying here. It's not like you can only take care of the hungry and the poor and you know, uh, things of that nature on the Sabbath. That's not what's being mentioned here, but those are wonderful things to do on the Sabbath. It's right, it's good to do well. It's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day, says Jesus. And these are the principles of Isaiah 58. And those who do this work, these are going to be the ones that would raise up the foundation of many generations and be the restorer of paths to dwell in. <clears throat> if thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath, now he's being very specific. Turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And of course, verse 14 <clears throat> deals with the blessed principles of uh, the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, and we don't have time to get into that here. But when it comes to Sabbath keeping and how to keep the Sabbath, of course, we've learned so far that it's from the evening to evening, the evening of, of Friday evening to Saturday evening is the time of the Sabbath. 
And on that day, we are not to pollute it. We're not to do our own works. We're not to speak our own words. We're not to find our own pleasure. Uh, we are to do works of benevolence. We're to do uh, labors of love. We are to remember God's creative works. Those are ways in which we can keep the Sabbath. God himself, as a matter of fact, the creator himself enjoyed creation. Notice what it says in the book of Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. <clears throat> Genesis chapter one in verse 31. In Genesis chapter one, verse 31, after God had finished all his creative works, after he had done all of that, and Isaiah, and, and excuse me, in Genesis chapter one, verse 31, the Bible says, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So at the end of creation week, all right, which is the six days of creation, of course, the seventh day capstone, uh, the end of the week, that is the uh, Sabbath, but the end of creation, the end of his works, he looked upon it and saw that it was very good. We can do the same. And that's what Sabbath, one of the ways that Sabbath can be kept is by enjoying the beauties of God's creative works. All right. Um, I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms 92. Psalms 92. Um, <clears throat> in Psalms 92, we don't necessarily have a mention of the Sabbath, but we do have a mention of the works of God. And of course, the works of God are to be commemorated on the Sabbath. And so therefore, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Psalms 92, uh, verses one through five is very important. In Psalm 92, verses one through five, notice what the Bible says. Psalms 92, verse one through five. The Bible says, <clears throat> it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the saw street and upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. And so commemorating the works of God, worshiping the Lord, um, you know, having worship service, singing his praises. This is what it's referring to in Psalms 92, but in reference to the works of God. If you look at the book of Psalms itself, uh, this is David and, and many others writing uh, poems and songs and hymns about the, the greatness of God and the greatness of his law, the greatness of his works. These are wonderful ways to keep the Sabbath holy. <clears throat> if you go to the book of Exodus chapter 20, in light of what we read in Isaiah 58 on how the children of Israel, even though they approached God as those who loved him and enjoyed spiritual things and enjoyed uh, spirituality and wanted God to notice them, one of the problems is they exploited their laborers, all right? And so when you look at Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, notice what the Bible says. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six, six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice the Sabbath is not just to be kept by the individual. All right. If you are a leader, or if you are a owner, if you are a uh, uh, head of household, um, Anyone who is in your home on the Sabbath day must keep the Sabbath holy. If you're having visitors who are not Sabbath keepers, there is a stipulation. Listen, if you're coming to my house on the Sabbath, if you're staying with me, there are certain things we do not do on this particular day. If you're going to be here, you're keeping the Sabbath holy. Otherwise, you are welcome to get a hotel, right? <laughs> Let's just be real. Bible says even a stranger that's within your gates, they are to keep the Sabbath. Your children are to keep the Sabbath. We're to make sure we keep the Sabbath holy, all right? So <clears throat> it's important. Now, 
it's a different thing. You might find yourself, and I'll mention this only because I've, I've gotten questions upon this, uh, but I had to get counsel on individuals. There's, there are people who might rent a room in a, in, 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 in a home. Um, you know, they're, they're, in that sense, you are in charge of your own abode. You are in charge of your own area. If you were be given a room, you are in charge of that room. You cannot force everyone in that house to keep the Sabbath. However, if you are not a Sabbath keeper and you are renting a room from Sabbath keepers, the owner of that home can say, one of the stipulations of uh, renting this room is you keep the Sabbath holy, right? And so um, if you're just simply renting a room or if you are you know, uh, staying in a place that is not owned by you, um, but you are a Sabbath keeper, you can't force everyone, but you can be an example of Sabbath keeping. Uh, but if you are a business owner, a leader of a business, um, you don't want to have you be off on your day and your business um, be still going on on the Sabbath. Don't exploit your laborers, even your cattle. You have to take off on that day. If you're a cattleman, if you're a rancher, um, your cattle need to rest on the Sabbath, right? You are to allow rest on that day. You're not to do the work on that day. <clears throat> but if you go to uh, chapter 16, go to chapter 16. I shouldn't say but, but uh, I want you to turn to chapter 16. New thought now. Uh, go to chapter 16 of the book of Exodus. Um, in Exodus chapter 16, we'll look at another principle of how we can keep the Sabbath holy. So we've talked about uh, when the Sabbath is to be kept. That's from sundown Friday to sundown uh, Saturday, even to evening. We've talked about not polluting the Sabbath by um, engaging in any of our uh, vocationary work, um, not doing our own pleasure upon that day, uh, speaking our own words, not involved in talk that is not Sabbath related or doing things that are not Sabbath or worship related to God or commemorating his works or things of that nature. Focus on the Lord and we want to make sure that we do that. It's easy um, especially with all the things around us, with the gadgets that we have, our cell phones, things of that nature, it's easy to get sidetracked. We want to make sure we go back to the basics of Sabbath keeping and remember God. All right, it's too easy to get sidetracked on the Sabbath day. Um, we've talked about how we are to do works of benevolence on that day. Uh, that is a wonderful time. The Sabbath is a wonderful day to do works and labors of love, to do good for people, to do good for others, um, to visit the sick and visit the fatherless and, you know, do just do, do wonderful labor on that day. These are the things that Jesus did and would do. Uh, we've also talked about, uh, you know, if we are a homeowner, if we are a business owner, that not only should we keep the Sabbath, but so should our household, so should those under our employ. You're not going to own a business and still let them work on the Sabbath. No, that business closes down. I remember uh, one of my very first jobs was I worked at the the bean factory, the Loma Linda, or actually it was La Sierra at the time, La Sierra Bean Factory. <clears throat> and the bean factory, uh, of course, made beans, right? But it did all dehydrated foods. Uh, we made food for Taco Bell. We made food for uh, Rosarita. We made food for um, you know, uh, all these different companies that do packaged um, either dry or canned beans and, and soups and things of that nature. So uh, we would make all of these things. And I remember the owner was a Sabbath keeper. The owner was a Seventh day Adventist. And so on Friday, you know, we would, man, we would work hard all week long, you know, and on Friday, the focus of the day was not even filling orders. The focus of the day was cleaning up the entire building. We had to make sure we sanitized everything, swept, cleaned up. We had to just have everything spick and span, bags folded. And when I'm talking about bags, there were these huge tote bags that, were a t that would hold a ton each. And so there was huge bags. They had to be folded in a certain way and stacked. The place was spick and span. I mean, it wasn't just left. It was cleaned up where it was just pristine. And we did all of that before closing uh, for the Sabbath. And that was at 2.30 every Friday, the place would close down. And so we worked hard, got everything done, uh, closed down early. They did, set, did that so that they can prepare uh, personally at their homes and uh, other people as well. And then when Sabbath was over, <clears throat> Friday, uh, Saturday evening, um, a few hours after that, 
uh, production can go uh, back on and uh, we would start working again, even uh, Saturday evening or early Sunday morning. And so that owner was blessed because they did so by uh, monetarily as well as getting accounts from all different well-known huge corporations and companies. And so, but they were Sabbath keepers and they made sure that everybody under their employ had that time off. And it was wonderful. Nobody complained <laughs> that the day was given, right? It was wonderful. So when we go to Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Exodus 16, <coughs> Exodus chapter 16, look at uh, Exodus 16 verses 22 through 25. Exodus 16, 22 through 25. It says in Exodus 16, verse 22 through 25, and it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, what is this which the Lord, excuse me, this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake that which ye shall bake today and seed that which ye shall seed. And that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until morning. And they laid it up until morning as Moses bade. And it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. And so one of the principles that we can bring out here in Exodus chapter 16 in the story of the miracle of the manna and the blessing of the Sabbath or the keeping of the Sabbath uh, in connection with the manna is that God made sure that on Friday, he gave them twice as much bread that he did on any other day during the week, because that was to keep them for that day, as well as for the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, they were not cooking. On the Sabbath, they were not preparing. On the Sabbath, they were not making, you know, they were not out there gathering the manna and doing their, their stuff. The food was prepared prior to the Sabbath so that they didn't have to cook on the Sabbath because doing so would be breaking the Sabbath. So if we are Sabbath keepers, if we're new Sabbath keepers, if we're desiring to be true Sabbath keepers, Friday is preparation day. Make sure your food for your family is prepared there. Make sure if you're, you know, you know, make sure you have everything prepared. That doesn't mean that you can't warm something on, on the Sabbath or, or whatever, or, you know, that's, that's not what it's talking about, but we want to make sure that we do no cooking on that day and preparation on that day. Um, you know, there's a lot of different questions on that, that people have, and, you know, people have asked me, uh, Matter of fact, I got an email maybe two or three weeks ago regarding this question, how um, there was an individual asking, saying, you know, when it comes to the Sabbath, I've had times where, um, you know, people have shown up, let's say, to the church on Sabbath or to a place where they're meeting um, strangers, people from off the street, and they had nothing, they had no food, they, they, they were needy. And, um, you know, let's say they didn't have anything prepared for extra guests or whatever. Uh, they were asking if it was wrong for them to make sure that they fed the hungry on the Sabbath, uh, even if there was nothing prepared already. And I just directed them back to what Jesus said and the principles that we looked at, that it's right to do good on the Sabbath day. And in Isaiah chapter 58, it's to you know, deal our bread to the hungry, the Bible says. So we can provide for people. But when it comes to us, when it comes to preparation, when it comes to um, looking ahead towards keeping the Sabbath holy, we want to make sure that we prepare. And maybe it's always good to prepare a little bit of extra because you never know what's going to happen or who's going to come over uh, to visit you on Sabbath or what you might need. You might need to go visit someone who didn't have food and well, if you had extra, you could prepare to bring some of that uh, with you. So it's always good to prepare before the Sabbath. So proper Sabbath keeping, proper observance of the Sabbath is preparing ahead of time. And not just the food. Uh, we want to make sure that when it comes to doing our ironing or blackening our shoes or whatever it might be, do those things on Friday or another day during the week, but don't do them on Saturday. And if it's not done, leave it undone. All right. So. Let's move on now. So we've covered a lot of different principles of the Sabbath. I want to kind of transition now at the, I'm going to try to make this the end of this particular study on the law. We've looked at the Sabbath specifically. We've looked at the law as a whole. Um, I just want to touch a little bit about the origins of Sunday worship. Now, I'm not going to get into the prophetic aspects and go into the book of Daniel and things of that nature, but just talk about the origins. <coughs> 
the origins of Sunday keeping, the origins of, of first day worship. And you can see some principles in the Bible and history without going through prophecy to show this. So I would like to start in the book of Job. <clears throat> Go with me in the book of Job chapter 31. All right, we're going to Job chapter 31. J-O-B chapter 31. And we're looking at verses 26 through 28. All right, so we're in Job 31, 26 through 28. And so we're ending this particular uh, lesson on the study of the Sabbath and the study of the law on the origins of Sunday worship. All right. So in Job 31, verses 26 through 28, and I'm doing this uh, because I think it's good to be able to have this information to share with people. But again, for those who might be new to Sabbath keeping or um, that you're trying to introduce Sabbath keeping to, the question comes up, and even if they don't ask the question, it's always good to show, well, if se the seventh day Saturday is the Sabbath, then why Sunday? Why do the majority of Christians keep Sunday? Well, let's go through some origins of Sunday worship. It's nothing new. It did not start, you know, in the New Testament or, you know, it did not start uh, uh, with Christianity uh, even. It started way before Christianity, you know, the, the title Christianity is concerned. I mean, the very first people upon the earth, we could say were, were Christians, right? Uh, the followers of Christ. Uh, we could say that, uh, but that term wasn't used until uh, New Testament times. But the beginnings of the world, the very first people that uh, lived upon this earth, they kept the Sabbath, all right? But shortly thereafter, especially after sin, uh, you can trace this through the line of Cain, they uh, began to keep a different day. And um, we want to look at some of these things. Go to Job 31, verse 26. Job 31, verse 26. And if anything, it was more so by the way of rebellion, all right? God's people, God's true people, they would keep the Sabbath, they would keep God's law. And so by way of rebellion, uh, everything was done uh, opposite, right? Uh, and of course, it's greater than that, but we're just trying to keep things simple. So Job 31, verse 26 through 28, the Bible says, if I beheld the sun when it shined or the moon walking in brightness and my heart hath been secretly enticed or my mouth has kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge for I should have denied the God that is above. Now, I like this particular verse because what Job is actually referring to here when he's talking about beholding the sun and the moon and his heart being enticed and him kissing the hand, he's actually talking about affinity for or the worship of the host of heaven, all right? Um, this was a practice that uh, took place in early times after sin. They would worship the host of heaven. I want to look at actually a few uh, texts with you regarding that. There are uh, at least 20 or so texts, 19, 20 texts in the Bible um, that deal with the host of heaven. Um, but I want to look at the ones that refer to worship. Um, look at Deuteronomy chapter four. Deuteronomy chapter four. You don't have to go far before you see individuals worshiping the host of heaven in the Bible. So in Deuteronomy chapter four and verse 19, Deuteronomy chapter four and verse 19, we read this. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the heavens. All right, so um, the Bible identifies that there were people who would worship the sun, they would worship the moon, they would worship the stars. Um, if you really get into it, what's really interesting, for an example, and it, and it touches uh, even every aspect of our society uh, in the world today, when it comes to the first through seventh day. In the Bible, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, only two of those days were actually named, okay? There was the sixth day, sixth day, which was known as preparation day. And there was the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. All the other days were first day, second, third, and so on. 
all right? But it wasn't until pagan culture um, began the worship of the sun, moon, and stars and would equate certain days to the worship of either those, those bodies of the heavens or the deities that they represented that we got the names for our days. For an example, Monday is Moon's Day, all right? That was the day that they would worship the moon. And here in the Bible, it talks about that they would they could worship the moon. And we're not gonna go through all the texts, but there's many texts that talk about the worship of the host of heaven. They could worship the moon. On Tuesday, it was the god Tui, which I believe was Jupiter. Uh, and I might be wrong on that, but it was god Tui. Wednesday is Woden's Day, all right? The god Woden. Um, Thursday was Thor's Day. Uh, the god Thor, all right? Then you had Friday was Frigga, uh, which was the, the god or goddess Frigga, which they would worship. And then Saturday, where we get our name, the name Saturday versus what the Bible says was Sabbath, uh, they would call it Saturday, which was Saturn's day. Those are the worship of Saturn and the gods that were connected with Saturn. And then of course, it leaves for us Sunday, right? Which is an easy one. That was the day, the venerable day of the sun. That was the day that they would worship the sun. Now, the reason why the sun was given the first day of the week, the reason why the sun was the focus is because uh, the pagans believe that the sun is what gave life. The sun, without the sun, there can be no growth. Without the sun, there can be, you know, no, no, nothing, nothing, everything would die without the sun, right? <clears throat> so sun was the giver of life. Sun rose uh, rose up. It was, it was the, the, the dawning of life. And so the sun was worshiped as the chief God, the chief deity, chief deity. Um, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11, after the flood, you have the rise of the kingdom of, of Nimrod. Right, and Nimrod is a very interesting character. He's the one that built the Tower of Babel. And when you look at what took place with Nimrod in history, Nimrod and Semiramis and the their their child uh, Tammuz. Uh, but when Nimrod died, they believed that he went into the sun. All right, that he became the sun, and so the sun began to be worshipped. Nimrod was worshipped in the sun, and all the different cultures um, that 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 came from the Tower of Babel when there was the disbursement and the confusion of the language, all the different cultures, whether they went, you know, into Africa or, or you know, different places in Africa, in the Middle East, and went into South America and, and North America, wherever, well, Europe, wherever they went, you look at every single culture from Asian culture, European culture, uh, 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 you know, Hispanic, Latin culture, uh, African culture, whatever culture it might be, one thing is in common. Sunday, the venerable day of the sun, it, or the worship of the sun in some form or fashion is, is done. And that's because it began there at Nimrod's tower. It began there at Nimrod's Babylon, all right? And um, this was just the height of paganism that took place. And so when we look in the Bible, the Bible speaks about worshiping the hosts of heaven. And what Job is here saying, he says, listen, if I ever beheld the sun and the moon and uh, kissed my hand or I was enticed, he says in verse 28, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge for I should have denied the God that is above. So Job identifies that sun worship in its pagan form, right? Sun worship, there's no Christian form necessary. It's all pagan, but in its, its basic it, it, it's basic structure, sun worship denies the God above. And that's very important to remember. All right, so we'll come back to that point. But go with me to Ezekiel chapter eight. Let's just walk through some other texts in the Bible. Show some examples of sun worship. So Ezekiel chapter eight, in Ezekiel chapter eight, verses, uh, verse 16 specifically. Ezekiel chapter eight, <coughs> excuse me, verse 16. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter eight, verse 16, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worshiped the sun 
towards the east. Now here, this is referring to the children of Israel when they were in apostasy. Notice they turned their back on God and they worship the sun. So this goes along with what Job says that when we worship the sun and when you worship the sun, you deny the God that's above. All right, in Ezekiel chapter 18, you have to turn your back on God and the back on the temple of the Lord, the worship of Jehovah in order to worship the sun. Now in 1 Kings chapter 12, <clears throat> we have some interesting history that takes place here with Jeroboam. Um, and I really like this story for a number of reasons. But in 1 Kings chapter uh, 12, verses 25 through 33, this is shortly, of course, after uh, Solomon's kingdom was divided into north and south. Jeroboam had the 10 tribes of the north, and Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, of course, had the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, in the south. And uh, Jeroboam, and remember, in the south, in the kingdom of Jeroboam, excuse me, Rehoboam, um, this is where you had uh, Judah. This is where you had the temple in Jerusalem. This is where worship took place. So Jeroboam had a, 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 a issue to deal with. And the Bible speaks about this here. So in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25 through 33, the Bible says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people return unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Uh, sound familiar. That's what Aaron did, if you remember. But notice what's taking place here. So Jeroboam is like, look, I have the 10 northern tribes. And if people are trying to worship God, they're going to go down to Jerusalem. And by continuously going down to Jerusalem, their hearts will be there. And they'll turn back to Rehoboam. They're going to leave me as king of the northern tribes, of the, uh, of the 10 northern tribes, the king of Israel, and they'll, they'll kill me. So he took counsel to build two golden calves, these images of the beast he built, right? So he builds these two images of the beast, and he says that these are their gods. So he wanted the people to worship the golden calves. Now it says in verse 29, and he sent what set one in Bethel. Now Bethel, uh, it means the house of God, okay? And the other he put in Dan, and Dan means judge or was a symbol of civil power. So he puts one image of the beast in the house of God, the church, symbol of the church. He puts the other image of the beast in Dan, the judge, the symbol of civil power, the state. And so you have here a combination of church and state. And of course, uh, those who are into the study of prophecy in the book of Revelation uh, can gather much insight from that. But in verse 30, it says, and this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests, the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even the month which he has devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. <coughs> and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. I want you to notice that the day that he specifically chose to worship is very important. We know that God does things in cycles of seven. He did that from the beginning, first day to the seventh day, and then the cycle begins again. So if you were to think about it, every seven days would be the Sabbath. So the seventh day would be the Sabbath, and the 14th day would be the Sabbath, and the 21st day would be the Sabbath, and the 28th day, so on and so forth like that. Um, but what Jeroboam does, the Bible says he makes the 15th day the day that people came to worship. So when you think about that, what would the 15th day be? Oh, that would be the first day of the week. So here we have Jeroboam setting up again this false worship, and he's using the first day of the week, uh, which is the venerable day of the sun in pagan culture as the day for worship. And again, first day worship was always connected with paganism throughout biblical history. And when I say biblical history, do not detach that from world history. All right. Bible history is world history. What other history begins at the beginning? 
right? It's the world's history. And world history, Sunday worship, sun worship is always connected with paganism. Uh, that's just how it is in history. And there would be no historian that would tell you different. All right. So notice what it says in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 23, 2 Kings chapter 23. <coughs> In 2 Kings chapter 23, 2 Kings chapter 23, let's look at verse 5 and verse 11. And um, we'll find something interesting here. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 5 through 11. <clears throat> In 2 Kings 23, 5 through 11, of course, we're talking about, uh, this is Josiah's, uh, his, uh, reformations, and things that he's doing. So notice uh, <clears throat> uh, 2 Kings 23, 5, through 11, 5 and 11, not 5 through 11. It says, and he put down, he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places of the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also he burned uh, them also that burn incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to the hosts of heaven. And he took away the horses, verse 11, and he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entering into the house of the Lord, at the chamber of Nephimelech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. So when Josiah was reforming the apostasy in Israel, when he was bringing back Israel to God and the worship of Jehovah, anything that had to do with sun worship and the paganistic practices of Sunday worship, he destroyed them, all right? So Sunday worship has always been connected with paganism. Now, go to the New Testament. And this is where it becomes interesting because in the New Testament time period is where sun worship or pagan sun worship on Sunday enters into the Christian church. All right, this is where we find Christianity's connection to paganism. And so I wanna just close on these points here. We'll look at three verses uh, and then we'll look at some history just really quickly before we close this morning. So in the book of Acts chapter 20, here's Paul. And Paul is making some very uh, pointed statements to the church. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29, <coughs> Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. I want you to notice what Paul says. So we're looking at Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. The Bible says, for I know this, this is Paul. He says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And of course, these grievous wolves that he's speaking of here are not literal animals. These were, uh, this was a description of people, right? grievous wolves uh, that would enter in. Remember Christ said he had sent us as sheep amidst wolves. So he's talking about men, people. He says, after his departing shall grievous wolves enter in among them, not sparing the flock. And it says in verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. One of the problems that took place in the early church is that when many of the standard bearers left or when they passed away or when they were martyred, um, you had individuals rise up to try to fill the gaps, take their place. It was a wonderful opportunity to jump in and get followers, right? And so many of the men desired followers and they would sp speak perverse things. And it was in the time of the early Christian church where the principles of paganism were actually reintroduced or to the people. And I say reintroduced because many of those people had converted from paganism and came to Christianity and left those pagan practices. But then the, the pagan practices were reintroduced to them through Christian people or seemingly Christian circles. And, um, you know, we think that, well, in Paul's day, you know, uh, you know, this didn't really happen. We know that this took place really later on in the history of Rome. We know that Paul was around during the time of Rome, but Paul makes a very clear statement in 2 Thessalonians chapter two. In 2 Thessalonians chapter two and verse seven, Paul made it very clear that the mystery of iniquity already was working, right? In 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven, he says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
And so he was looking forward into time. He's looking forward into history. And he knew what was going to take place with Rome and how Rome would transition from paganism to papalism, from pagan Rome to papal Rome. But he said, listen, the mystery of iniquity was already working. Before papal Rome took the, took the throne, before papal Rome was on the scene, pagan Rome was already setting the stage. The mystery of iniquity was already working. And um, we know historically that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, when the Bible is referring to the little horn, which in a clear study in scripture, the little horn was Rome, papal Rome. We know that papal Rome's desire was to change times and laws, and that specifically focused on the Sabbath, right? That it would try to change the Sabbath. And it did introduce the Sabbath change. But the papacy was not who did that per se first. It just continued the work that paganism, Roman paganism, had already done. In history, there was the ruler Constantine, okay? Um, Constantine, who ruled between 306 to 337, uh, Constantine, in the beginning of his time, was a pagan sun worshiper. Uh, it's very clear. Historians will show you that very clear. I'll quote some historians in just a moment. But he was a pagan sun worshiper who, towards the end of his reign, actually converted to Christianity. And when he converted to Christianity, he kind of blended the two practices together. As a matter of fact, Edward Gibbon, you know, the historian Edward Gibbon, in his book, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, this is volume three on page 237, he says the sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector of Constantine. So this is why Constant, this is while Constantine was a Christian right? The sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector of Constantine. Constantine was the one who began to blend paganism and Christianity. Uh, Constantine, he made the first, the earliest Sunday law in the year 321, uh, 321 AD, of course, so he creates the earliest Sunday law in history in the year 321. And I'm going to read what this law was about. This is taken from Philip Schaff. This is the historian Philip Schaff, his book, The History of the Christian Church. This is volume three, page 380 in the note. It says, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in cities rest. This is the law, by the way, that Constantine wrote in 321. On the venerable day of the sun, <coughs> Let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let the workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their, continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting. Let by neglect, least by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. So even in this earliest Sunday law in 321, Constantine was just following the wayward Jews and exacting or exploiting their laborers, right? Uh, not allowing them to rest. So that was the first Sunday law in 321. People were commanded to rest unless, of course, you were you know, sowing grain or tending to the vines. In Chambers Encyclopedia, <clears throat> This is on the chapter on the Sabbath in Chambers Encyclopedia. This is volume 11, page 401. It says, unquestionably, the first law, either ecclesiastical or civil, by which the sabbatical observance of that day is known to have been ordained, is the Edict of Constantine in 321 AD. In other words, showing that the very first law where the Christian church was mandated to keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday, like the Bible identifies, was by Constantine. Constantine, that pagan who converted to Christianity, and all he did was baptize paganism. And so thereafter, the church, the Roman church, picked up where Constantine left off and began to persecute those who actually kept the Sabbath. And so now today in 2021, the majority of Christian churches look back in their history and they said, hey, from the beginning and rise of our churches, from the beginnings of Christianity, Sunday worship has always been with us. And so therefore Sunday worship is the day 
and they try to you know uh, arrest the scriptures to make that happen but of course history and bible show different all right so in the scriptures sun worship sunday worship the venerable day of the sun has always been pagan always will be pagan in history it was constantine in the year 321 uh, at the time, time around his conversion, before this, of course, his conversion beforehand, in 321, he makes a law to have Sunday kept as the day of the Lord, the day that was to be holy, all right? So uh, when we, I just want to see if I want to read this other statement here. Yeah, I'm going to read this too. Let me just read this too before I have some closing thoughts. <clears throat> Let me see where I want to pull up here. So, you know, after Constantine, of course, uh, I'm going to read this, but after Constantine, of course, makes this legislation, you know, the emperors and the popes in succeeding centuries, they just follow the laws and they strengthen those laws in, in Sunday observance. Um, but the day began as a pagan ordinance and ended as a Christian regulation. Okay, okay. so uh, in this particular statement, this is taken from, this is uh, Reverend Charles Joseph Heffel uh, and Henry N. Oxen in the History of the Church Councils from 326 to 429. This is volume two on page 316. Um, this is gonna talk about how basically the Edict of Constantine was followed by the Catholic Church Council of, of Laodicea. Uh, and notice at the Council of Laodicea what the Catholic Church did. Uh, it says, Christians shall not Judaize uh, and be idle on Saturday or the Sabbath, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day, they shall especially honor. And as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. So here's the Council of Laodicea. Christians are not to rest on the Sabbath. Instead, they are to focus on the Lord's day. So what's really interesting in the Council of Laodicea, something that most Christians fail to understand or fail to remember, is that the original Council of Laodicea, the church, made a distinction between the Sabbath and the Lord's day. Now the Christians try to say the Lord's day is the Sabbath, right? No, there's a difference between the Sabbath and, and uh, the Lord's day that the Christians claim. The Lord's day in the Bible, right? The Lord's day in the Bible, of course, is the Sabbath. But um, here they're saying, listen, you can't keep the Sabbath. You can't rest on the Sabbath. You can't keep the Sabbath holy, all right? You have to work on that day. This was a law, um, but you're to keep Sunday holy. You're to honor that day. And if you are found Judaizing, in other words, if you are found keeping the Sabbath, you are to be shut out from Christ. Very interesting. A total reversal to where we find in the scriptures. In the scriptures, those who were worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, those who were uh, worshiping the venerable day of the sun, Job says it would be a denial of God. You would be shut out from God. But now at the end of time, now the uh, the, the church at the end who has baptized paganism is saying that if you keep Sabbath and not Sunday, you're going to be shut out from God. So they totally reverse everything the Bible has to say. So we look in history, we look in the Bible, and it's very clear that God's law is to be kept forever, including the seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment. And we see in history how God's faithful have always kept the Sabbath. We see the blessings for keeping the Sabbath. We see what takes place, takes place when we don't keep the Sabbath. And we have seen very clearly how Sabbath has changed uh, to where most, now Christian, most Christians now keep Sunday. As far as history is concerned, it has always been a pagan day and it always will be a pagan day, even though a different coat of paint may be put on it and some different flowery words. History does not lie, neither does the Bible. It's very clear that Sunday was a pagan day of worship and never a day that God's people would be keeping it, all right? So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and close. And the next time we come back together in our next study on the house that wisdom uh, has built, we'll be looking at another principle of the truth of scripture that upholds 
wisdom's house. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very thankful for your word and we're thankful for history. We're thankful, Lord, that you have made these, <laughs> these things clear for us. 